Well, my name is Bob Manukin. I chair the program on negotiation, and I want to welcome all of you. It's my very great <coughs> pleasure today uh, to introduce uh, my friend and our guest speaker, uh, Mohammed Shteya. Uh, he, and I, he welcomed me to his office in Ramallah uh, in 2011, and we conspired over time to try to get him here to Harvard. Uh, and uh, uh, at long last, uh, uh, we succeeded uh, because he's making a visit here. And, uh, he's uh, sp spoke at Tufts yesterday and at Harvard uh, uh, today. Uh, <coughs> I don't think we could have a more interesting person to uh, provide us with a, uh, a Palestinian perspective uh, on uh, both recent events uh, and uh, the prospects uh, for uh, a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, Dr. Shteya uh, has had a remarkably distinguished career. He was born in a small Palestinian town of Tel, which is in, uh, near Nablus, just outside of Nablus. Uh, and he is a professional economist. Uh, he studied economics at Bersight University uh, near Nablus, and he then got a PhD in economics in England from the University of Sussex. <coughs> the important thing to understand is he has put his economics training uh, to practical use in terms of the service of the Palestinian people. Uh, I'm not going to go through his whole uh, career, uh, but I do want to underscore a few uh, critical points. He is the minister, that is, he's the top person at what's called the Palestinian Council for Development and Reconstruction. Pe PECDAR, which is the acronym, manages an investment fund <coughs> of over a billion dollars, and it has implemented and monitored national projects funded by the Palestinian Authority and its international uh, partners. Uh, for PECDAR, he most recently uh, uh, developed a plan uh, and price the plan for uh, what it would cost in terms of the reconstruction and development of Gaza following the war. Uh, that, that is a, a PECDAR a publication that I think is available on the internet. Yeah. Uh, he is one of 20 members of the Fatah Central Committee, which is the highest decision-making body of the Fatah organization. Uh, and in fact, uh, for the uh, a Palestinian Authority. He was the former Minister of Public Works. He's a, been a governor of the Islamic Bank. Uh, and uh, so his career in terms of economic development is broad, and as a political actor, quite broad uh, and important. <coughs> uh, we at the Program on Negotiation are especially uh, pleased to welcome him here because of his role uh, as a negotiator. Uh, he has been a senior member of uh, nearly all of the Palestinian delegations to various peace talks, uh, beginning uh, with uh, the Madrid conference in 1991, where he did some of the preliminary work before that conference began. And uh, most recently, uh, he, along with uh, Sib Erika, were the two critical Palestinian negotiators in the recent Kerry Initiative in 2013 and 2014. So he's a man that in fact has in, uh, really been in the middle of the process and we welcome him here to Cambridge and to Harvard and we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, he's uh, he's going to make remarks. Uh, uh, we're going to finish promptly at 5.30 and I'm sure we'll have uh, plenty of time uh, uh, for questions uh, uh, from the audience as well. Mr. Steyer. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Bob. I really appreciate the invitation. And I would like to thank the audience for being here to listen to me this afternoon. Let me tell you what in the corridor I was told. They asked me whether this should be recorded or not. I would like all of you <coughs> to
to take notes, to tweet, to do whatever you want of whatever I say, as long as you get it right. <laughs> so I will be more than happy if this is recorded as well. <clears throat> Let me start <clears throat> by putting a few facts to you in order for us. If we get the facts right, then we definitely get the analysis right, and then definitely we will reach the right conclusion. The facts are the following. <clears throat> Israel was established in 1948, over 78% of what used to be called Palestine. In 1948, that part of Palestine became Israel, and there are two regions they have been left aside. One called the West Bank, which is actually the West Bank of the River Jordan, because that part was annexed to Jordan in 1950. And the little tiny part that was called Gaza Strip was also annexed by Egypt, and so it became part of an Egyptian ter territory. In 1967, these two little tiny parts were also occupied by Israel in 1967. In 1948, 750,000 Palestinians were made refugees, and in 1967, 250,000 Palestinians were referred to as displaced people. Now, I wanted to mention these two important facts because it will take us to where are we heading and where we will be leading the discussion. The Palestinian leadership has adopted two strategies. I'm happy Professor Kelman is here. The first strategy was arm struggle strategy to liberate Palestine. I don't say this strategy failed. This strategy might have taken us from point A to point C. Another strategy by the Palestinian leadership was adopted in 1988, which is called the Palestinian Peace Initiative, launched in Algier, 15th of November 1988. That strategy has actually led to the Madrid Conference and later on to the Oslo Agreement and all the peaceful session and rounds that has taken place since then. I was the first Palestinian who landed in Madrid October 1991 for the Madrid Peace Conference. Bob, at that time I was not married, I didn't have a gray hair. And <clears throat> when I told this to President Obama in his office, he said, now that you have two kids at High Point University, your gray hair is because of the high fees at that university. It's not because of the peace process. <coughs> but <clears throat> the point to tell you here is that we have been in this track for the last 24 years now. And maybe this is actually the longest peace track ever. I haven't, you're a professor of negotiations, I don't really know whether there has been a longer track or not, but regardless, it has been so long talking to end the conflict between us and the Israelis. Out of the Oslo Madrid conference, an outcome came to be called the establishment of the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority, the official name of it is Palestinian Interim Self-Governing Authority, abbreviation BISGA. I myself, I was one of the people who believed in the process simply because of the letter I. I was hoping the I for interim will become an I for independence in accordance with the agreement after four, five years of the negotiations. The agreement was interim agreement that should have lasted for five years and should have ended by May 4th, 1999, upon which a Palestinian state should have been created by that time. It didn't work, and until today, we are actually in the interim period until today. So we passed the first phase and then second and third and so on. So for the last 24 years, we tried to launch the peace talks in Madrid. We did, and we tried to conclude the peace talks in Camp David with President Clinton, but it didn't work. While the two delegations were backing their luggage to leave Camp David, one member of the Palestinian delegation went to George Tenet, and he told him, Mr. Tenet, 
Yasser Arafat is a bit angry that you might blame it on him that Camp David has failed. So Mr. Tinnit went to Yasser Arafat and he told him, Mr. Chairman, don't worry. You are living in an area in which neither geography nor demography are stable. You are living in an area in which neither demography nor geography are stable. I say this bearing in mind the developments of the region today. One million Christians have been driven out of Iraq and half million Christians were driven out of Syria and three million refugees out of Syria. Iraq is a de facto, in de facto partition, Syria as well, and the region is in serious turmoil. Now, in Camp David, it didn't work. We couldn't reach an agreement for the all obvious reasons. And then we tried to relaunch the end of the talks by 2003 in Annapolis. Remember one important thing. Every war in the region has brought some sort of peace initiative. The Madrid conference came after the Americans liberated Kuwait from the Iraqis. 2003, Annapolis came after the Iraqi occupation or the American occupation of Iraq. Today, there is a war on ISIL, and today is the first time that there is no peace package that is accompanying what is happening in the region today. Because it is important to note these things so that we draw the right conclusion out of all of this. Now, <clears throat> we tried after Camp David, Mitchell tried to uh, launch another round of talks. They called it proximity talks, so that Senator Mitchell will talk to the Palestinians, and then he goes and talk to the Israelis and try to come up with something. It didn't work. Senator Mitchell resigned. And then we came up with what the quartet, the quartet is four countries, United Nations, United States, Europe, as well as the UN. So the Quartet called for another round of negotiations. They called it indirect talks. <clears throat> so we had many meetings at the Jordanian capital, Palestinians and Israelis. Again, it didn't work. <clears throat> now, with all the American presidents who were there, from Bush the father to Clinton, Bush the son, President Obama, the whole of the process, it has not been concluded in really a successful a treaty that ends the conflict. And then, as if the Palestinians were left with one option, either negotiations or negotiations, as if we were left with one option. <clears throat> now, when we went to the Madrid talks, remember this figure because it is important for the conclusion. There were in the Palestinian territories <clears throat> 150,000 Jewish settlers. In 1967, there were zero Jewish settlers in the West Bank and Gaza. By the time of the Madrid conference, there were 150,000 Jewish settlers. Why do I say this? Because it is important to note of what I will say in the conclusion of my remarks that today there are 651,000 Jewish settlers who make 21% of the total population of the West Bank. So with all these <coughs> sort of attempts that we were trying, it actually didn't work. <coughs> Why it didn't work? And this is important for the program on negotiations. It didn't work for many reasons. One is that the Palestinian-Israeli relationship on the negotiating table was a symmetrical relationship. Somebody is a party that is very strong. A party is much weaker. And not only that, <clears throat> all the measures that have been taken were actually not measures to really lead us to the direction where we can reach a conclusion. <clears throat> and the second important issue, <clears throat> the Israelis did not want to negotiate. The Israelis wanted to dictate certain uh, parameters or certain solutions. It has to do with Jerusalem, the Jordan Valley and the rest of the Palestinian territory. So I, I felt that we, we were never negotiating. They, there is a set agenda they wanted up to, us to accept, which it never happened. But also, <coughs> because of this imbalance, the third point, because of the imbalance <coughs> on the negotiating table, we invited a third party. And the third party is the United States. And we know that the United States enjoys a strategic relationship with Israel. 
<coughs> so when you invite a third party, the idea is to correct the imbalance. What happened in our case is that the imbalance became more imbalanced and the gap became even wider. To the extent that when, when Martin Endick was appointed under Secretary John Kerry, and he was supposed to be sitting with us on the table. Actually, the Israeli delegation never allowed Martin Indyk to attend even one round of talks. So this has shown that the third party intervention is not always a good idea as long as that third party does not really contribute to bridging the gap. And I will come to this in a bit in a more detail. But also, <coughs> the other important thing is the events in the region. Israel today believes that it, is, it can sleep on a silk mattress. Very comfortable. Well, Iraq is not anymore Iraq. Syria is not anymore Syria. Libya is not anymore Libya. So Israel is not under any pressure to make compromises or to end occupation. And I think that has contributed seriously to the lack of progress over the last round of talks, which was shepherded by Secretary Kerry, 29th of July 2013 until the 29th of March 2014. Also, I think one of the most serious problems that we have had is that the Israelis believed that the Palestinians had no option, only one option, either negotiations or negotiations. And I think that was very mistakenly uh, uh, calculated by the Israeli leadership. More than that, it was extremely worrying that even though we had the quartet, the four players, but there was a monopoly of Washington over the process. And this sort of monopoly, bearing in mind the strategic relationship between Washington and Israel, it didn't really contribute much to making certain progress of the situation because whatever pressure Washington will put in Israel, it will be interpreted in a totally different way that, you know, to a certain extent, some Israeli leaders, they were saying this is anti-Semitism, this is not good, this is, this is, this is, this is. Now, also, what I want to tell you why things didn't work is simply because of what they call in negotiations confidence building measures. There were no confidence building measures. Israel has employed confidence destruction measures, in particular reference to the uh, uh, launching tenders of construction of settlements, killing 60, 64 Palestinians were killed during the process. I'm speaking about the last nine months of the process, and so on. So there were no confidence building measures to really contribute to a conclusion or to reach an agreement. Now, the Palestinian side who is under occupation was asked to come up with compromises. In my opinion, the biggest compromise that the Palestinian did is to accept a Palestinian state on only a 22% of the total area of the West Bank. So what remained of this Palestine, that the West Bank and Gaza is only 22% of the total area of Palestine, and we have accepted that the Palestinian state will be only on these two little tiny geographies. That was a biggest compromise. But more than that, we did more compromises. In order for us to accommodate the Israeli security concern, we have accepted that Palestine will be a demilitarized state. We have accepted the Israeli request to have what they call territorial swap wherever it is needed. We have accepted to bring NATO forces, American forces, European forces, whoever, in the Jordan Valley, where Israel considers the Jordan Valley as a security zone. If any of you have traveled through the Jordan Valley, Shula, one of them, she will know very well that the Jordan Valley actually is not only a security zone, it is an economic zone, where from the Dead Sea to all the way north, about... Uh, 28 kilometers, you will see sherry tomatoes, you will see, you see palm trees, you will see grapes without seeds, you will see crocodile farms. It's an economic zone and it is not really a security zone. Even if it is a security zone in the age of satellites and Star Wars and so on, what is the point of having uh, three, four tanks on the River Jordan 
1990, Saddam Hussein was able with his primitive missiles to launch it from Baghdad to Tel Aviv. These tanks didn't stop launching these missiles. Anyhow, I'm not an expert in military affairs, but I can tell you that if you drive through the valley, you will not see much of a military presence. All what you see is really an economic zone. Now, also, we have accepted Jerusalem to be an open city. That was a compromise. We have also accepted the idea of a gradual withdrawal whenever it is needed. So the Palestinians came with many compromises. On the other hand, we haven't really heard a compromise. We heard on the, from the Israeli side the following. I'm speaking about the last nine uh, months of talks between us and them. The Palestinian delegation had two people. I was 50% of the delegation. And the Israeli delegation were two people as well. <coughs> What was, what is it that we were told? We were told, Bob, that the Jordan Valley, which is 1,622 kilometers, that makes actually 28% of the total area of the West Bank, they, we were told either you give it to us or we take it. And we were told that 1967 border is not a border between Palestine and Israel. And then when we asked what is a border, how do you draw a border? We were told that borders are drawn on the following criteria. One, a border has to take in consideration the security concerns of the state of Israel. Second, a border has to take in consideration demographic reality on the ground, i.e. the Jewish settlements. Third, a border has to take in consideration the water aquifers. Historical sites, archaeological sites, social coherence between communities. So we were given a 12 points a criteria of how to draw a border. The Jordan Valley. And then Israel wanted to annex what they call the settlement blocks. The settlement blocks actually make more than 13% of the total area of the West Bank. The Jordan Valley is 28% and Jerusalem is the rest. When we came back from that round, I asked our computer engineer to put together all these things on a map, and he ended by having a map in which Israel will be annexing 45% of the total area of the West Bank. So that was actually the offer. In addition to that, they wanted to trade the 1967 issues with the 1948 issues, i.e. to totally cancel the right of return of the Palestinian refugees. So that was really the focus of the Palestinian-Israeli negotiation in the last round of, of talks. Now, I think, speaking in front of a professor of negotiations and at the school of law here, I think any peace negotiations needs a recipe before success. That recipe before success was actually never there. It was never there. What is the reason before success? In order for you to have a successful peace talks, you need to have a clear, agreed upon terms of reference. In the last round, there were no terms of reference. And when I asked our American counterparts, what are the terms of reference for these talks? They said, well, these talks have no terms of reference, which meant actually that we were reading from one book maybe in Arabic, and the Israelis were reading from another book, maybe Hebrew. And both of us don't speak each other language. So there was not an agreed upon terms of reference, i.e. to say that these talks are based on the basis of the formula of land for peace. Or these talks are based on UN resolution 242338181194, whatever. So it was not there at all. Without any clear terms of reference, it is difficult to lead a negotiation anywhere because it becomes like unguided missiles. You can shoot anywhere, you will never hit the target. The second important issue, negotiations, they need what they call CBMs, confidence building measures. One day I asked Madame Levney, I told her, Madam, we are here to empower each other because I should be credible in the eyes of the Palestinian public in the same way that you should be credible in the eyes of the Israeli public. What is it that I can do to empower you? She said, there is this sheikh somewhere in a village near Naples. In his Friday praying, he actually, you know, say not nice things about the Jews and so on. 
So we called the Minister of Islamic Waqf. Do you know this name? He said, yes. We told him, please, can you stop him not leading the next Friday? Because he is not fully educated. And we need to streamline him in a way to serve the purpose of what we are doing. The man was dismissed from his job. And then the second round, I asked Madame Levni, can you please ask me, how is it possible for you to empower me? Until this single minute, she didn't ask me. But I told her, the, the best way to empower me is to stop settlements and settlements and settlements. Because that is, how me, that is what makes the process credible in the eyes of the Palestinian public. That is what makes the process credible in the eyes of the international public. What is the point of building Jewish settlements in an area that is supposed to be the state of Palestine? And you are doing this during the course of negotiations. A big question mark from our side on this issue. The third important recipe for success is actually a time frame. In the initial remarks, I started by saying this process has been ongoing for 24 years. The question for us is for how long? For how long can this process continue? Where do you draw a border? Where, when it is possible for me to tell my daughter that we can go to Nablus without a military checkpoint? And she keeps asking me this question. When are these Israelis going to leave us? And I, can, I don't have an answer for her. I don't have an answer for her. I don't have an answer for you, for anybody. So there has to be a clear time frame in which this occupation should end. Not only this, but any time, any negotiation should have a time frame. The fourth important recipe for success is to have an honest broker. An honest broker. I don't say that the broker was not honest. But I'm saying that any negotiation needs an honest broker. And the broker should know exactly what is he doing. Because if you ask a broker, what are you? Are you a facilitator? Or are you a broker? Or are you, an, or are you a mediator? Because each of this Bob, each of this has its own terms of reference. A facilitator, you bring the people to the table. A mediator, you might need to bridge some proposals. And so on. So each has its own. Unfortunately, at certain times, our American colleagues, they were not sure whether they are mediators, honest brokers, or facilitators. Because each has its own terms of reference. The last thing is to have good intentions. Peace is about good intentions. There is no way that you can reach a peaceful agreement without good intentions. Chamberlain signed with Adolf Hitler the Treaty of Munich, and two months after, the Second War broke out. So there is no value of the ink on a piece of paper if the intentions are bad. We never felt that during the term of Netanyahu's government that Netanyahu believed in two states. Not only because I said this, and I should tell you what Bob didn't tell you. What Bob didn't tell you in introducing me is that I resigned from the negotiations after five months simply because I, it was, I was 100% sure that there is a process of the destruction of two states. There isn't a process of a creating of a two states because of the continuation of all the measures on the ground and so on and so forth. Now... <clears throat> What is it that we want to do today? Speaking about the new paradigm. In my opinion, the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations will lead us to nowhere. The Palestinian-Israeli negotiations, we all know what the solution is. We all know, whether at Harvard or at Tufts or at Birzeit or wherever, we or on the negotiating table, we all know what the solution is. The question is, is there a de Klerk in Israel? Is there a de Gaulle in Israel who is ready to implement what is needed to end occupation that has occurred on the Palestinian territory in 1967? Netanyahu is not a de Klerk and he's not a de Gaulle. Netanyahu's agenda, as he said, he is there to destroy the possibility of a two-state solution. Now, for us, the Palestinians, we are stuck. What do you do in such a situation? 24, 50 years, 65 years of our people, refugees in Lebanon, Syria, and so on. 
Palestinian territory has been under occupation since 1967. We don't want to go to violence because you will blame us for being terrorists and so on and so forth. And we don't believe in it anymore. And you always ask us to go back to negotiations. We have been into this process for 24 years. So what do you, what do you want us to do? I don't need your advice. I will tell you what we decided to do. <clears throat> we decided to internationalize the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Take it to the international agenda. Whether it is right or wrong, whether it will help us liberate Palestine, that's a different story. I know it will not, but at least nothing will stay silent. The internationalization of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is taking three main dimensions. A political, economic, and legal. The political track is we decided to go to the Security Council, to the United Nations Security Council that is mandated to make peace and security all over the world. And we went to the UN for a proposal to say, you, the UN, we would like you to vote on the following proposal. End occupation that has occurred on the Palestinian territory in 1967 with a time frame within two we are ready to accept three years. Now, you can imagine the conclusion. <clears throat> the United States of America has decided to fight this proposal. They didn't accept it. They told us they will veto it. But you know, in the UN system, you have to have nine votes in order for you to put a proposal for voting. If you don't have nine votes, the proposal is not voted on. We had the nine votes all pocketed in the bucket of our ambassador at the United Nations. Fifteen minutes before, one country switched, called Nigeria. We know why. Nigeria was put under incredible pressure, incredible pressure that the president had to make an overriding right over his minister of foreign affairs and to shift the voting in the last 15 minutes. They voted, we got eight votes, and so this UN game is really painful for us. And I will tell you one important thing. Why I'm mentioning this? Because yesterday in Washington, people were debating whether the administration is going to change its policy vis-a-vis -vis Israel at the United Nations. In 2011, Secretary Hillary Clinton, she made a wonderful statement against the establishment of Jewish settlements in Palestinian territory. She said they are illegal, they are embedment to bees, they are not helpful. Every single, cat every single categorization, every single label was given to that process. So I said, this is really wonderful. I went to our president and I told him, why don't we, you know, cut and base what Secretary Hillary Clinton said. Take it to the UN as a resolution and let them vote for it. He said, okay, let's try it. 2011, we did. Cut and paste, literally, what Hillary Clinton said. Put it for the UN to vote. The American delegation vetoed what Hillary Clinton was saying. So therefore, this shows you that the whole of the process is really at the UN. We are going to continue trying because simply the UN is not about delegitimization of Israel. The UN is a legitimate international organization that people go to for peace and security. We were vetoed, and we decided to take things to a totally different direction, which is bilateral recognitions. The Spanish parliament voted for recognizing Palestine. The French parliament, the British parliament, Belgium, Luxembourg, Italy, Spain, Portugal. We are left with Greece. We were waiting for the change of government. Now things have changed. We will go to Greece as well. But we know that this sort of bilateral things, it is helpful. Why do we, why is it that we are doing this? Because the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is not anymore on the basis of the Vietnam-Algerian model. It's not a knockout. The Palestinian-Israeli conflict will be settled with points, accumulative points. So we are hoping that we are accumulating points against occupation for this occupation to end. So this is the first dimension of the internationalization of the struggle, which is the political dimension. There is the second dimension, which is the economic dimension. We have asked Europe to label 
all the settlements product not to allow these settlement products into the European market. And Europe has passed what they call European guidelines not to allow any European money to be invested beyond the 1967 border, which is in practice today. Not only that, we are also working on not allowing every double national settler to be in the Palestinian territory in a way that his nationality his government to say that, dear Mr. So-and-so, you are a holder of a passport of France. You are there illegally in unoccupied territory. We cannot protect you there. We ask you to leave. So that sort of economic track we are working on as part of the internationalization of the struggle. The third important issue, in a few days' time, April 1st, Palestine will be a member of the International Criminal Court. We are going to submit against Israel two charges. One, because of the last aggression on Gaza, where 2,200 Palestinians were killed, 60,000 Palestinian houses were partially or completely destroyed, and Israel has left 1.8 million tons of rubble of destroyed infrastructure and so on and so forth. One second charge against Israel is the issue of the settlements. It's a straightforward issue. It's against international law. So therefore, we think it is a winning case. So this is the third dimension, which is the legal dimension, the political, the economic, the legal dimension. And that is the most important part of the story, simply because the internationalization of the conflict, it has to be a total paradigm shift in a way that the issue is not anymore issue of negotiations. The issue is a matter of the international community should impose, the international community should impose a solution in a way that will oblige Israel to withdraw its forces from the territories occupied in 1967. Now, I am coming to nearly a conclusion. <clears throat> now, listen to this. The biggest problem about terms of reference is that since Madrid, Madrid was the only process that had a terms of reference. But after Madrid, we didn't have a terms of reference. Sometimes it is Clinton parameters becomes a terms of reference. Sometimes John Kerry's framework agreement. Sometimes it is the speech of President Bush 14th of June 2002 in the, Nor in the Rose Garden becomes a terms of reference for Annapolis and so on and so forth. This should not continue to be the case. <coughs> Going to the UN, it will enable us to have the international law as a terms of reference for ending the conflict. And this is the most important part of the story. If you make reference to international law, which does not allow a country to occupy other people's territory by force, then we are having a clear agreed, whether it is agreed upon, but it's a clear international reference for any future negotiations. Now, also, then if that sort of resolution is passed, then the negotiation becomes technicalities go and draw the border. We know the 67 border, but then it becomes a technical, so the technical teams will work on technicalities and the negotiation does not become political anymore. How do you do this? I think in order for us to break this negotiating table at the bilateral level, which has a symmetrical relationship, I think the way out is to go for an international conference. If, it is, if there was a Geneva for Iran, and a Geneva for Syria, why not an international conference in Geneva for Palestine in which all the players will participate? Saudi Arabia, United States, United Nations, the European Union, and others. Because without having an international will that is really ready to impose a solution, then we will, be, we will continue to work in a vicious circle, leaving the Palestinians as if we are victims to one option, either negotiations or negotiations. Also, the economic dimension of the internationalization is actually to replace a certain paradigm. What happens today is the following. 
the international community, Israel and Palestine. <clears throat> if the peace process is going well, the international community give us aid. If the peace process is not going well, then we are punished twice. More settlements, no peace process, and no money. There has not been a case in which Israeli behavior was linked to the economic relationship between Israel and the United States or Israel and Europe. It was only possible under the times of James Baker, 1991, when he took his business card, threw it on the table for Ishaq Shamir, and he told him, if you want peace, call me. If you want to continue with Jewish settlements, we are going to deduct it from the aid that is given by United States to Israel. And they did link the construction of settlements to the loan guarantees offered by the United States to Israel. In that way, you will change the dynamic that has been there for 24 years. Because without this link, then Israel will always feel that the carrot is going to be always there. I, am, I know I am a realistic person. I know it is difficult to move from the carrot to a stick. I know that. I know what the Congress is. But I know what is possible. It is possible that we can move from carrot to non-carrot. And I think that will be important because Europe is going into this direction of from uh, carrot to non-carrot. But also, Bob, let me tell you one thing. The British, they have a nice proverb that says, you can bring the horse to the river, but you cannot force him to drink. That was exactly the problem. Because if you bring Netanyahu to the river, Netanyahu saturated with, with champagne made in California, <laughs> he will never be forced to drink. The only way to force Netanyahu to drink is to make him thirsty. And the American administration did not make Netanyahu thirsty. And I think that is an important element in any future negotiation where you have to, ha you have to make the two parties have something to lose or something to benefit if they don't really abide, abide by the rules of the game. Now, also, let me conclude by saying the following. For us, the Palestinian people, we are the ones under occupation. <clears throat> we are the ones who would like to see a successful peace talks. We are the ones to benefit most. And that is why every time we are called to sit down with the Israelis, we will go. Because we are waiting for the minute in which the sufferings of the, our people are alleviated for, 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 uh, for, forever. <clears throat> and President Abbas today, not only that I say it's because he's my president, but go all over Europe. Go to Washington. Everybody will tell you he is the man for peace. He is the real partner. And that Netanyahu, to call him a non-partner, it was shocking not only for me, but for everybody as well. This is a man who is peaceful, who doesn't want to go into violence. He is for two states. He is for negotiation. He has been the champion of the Oslo process. He has been, he has been. And now the Israelis don't deal with him as if he is a, a non-partner. But also, look at what is happening today. <clears throat> We are stuck with the, full on, with the following reality that Israel wants us to be stuck in. What is it? We are stuck in what I call the trap of the status quo. The trap of the status quo. What is the status quo? The status quo today is our land minus 600 acres every month and our land with 2,000 settlers every month. The trap today is that we have a Palestinian authority that has no authority whatsoever. If our president wants to move from Ramallah to Nablus, he needs a permit from the Israeli military governor. If I need to travel through Tel Aviv, I need three permits. One permit that allows me into Israel, and other two permits that they allow me to go to Tel Aviv airport, and so on and so forth. So this is the reality that we are in today. The reality that we are in today, that we are into a custom union with Israel as if we are one territory. 
Israel exports to us 4.1 billion dollars of goods and commodities and we are only allowed to export to Israel a total value of 350 million dollars. The reality that we are stuck in today is that the water balance sheet in the Palestinian territory is 800 million cubic meters. Israel takes 600 million cubic meters of our water and they sell to us 120 million cubic meters. So we buy our own water. The reality today that we are stuck in is that Israel collects taxes on our behalf because we don't have borders. And for the last three months, Israel is freezing the money which makes 60% of our salary bill every month. So our civil service, they have not been paid for month of February, March, and maybe April. So the reality today that the Palestinian territory is used as a dumping territory for all the solid waste, the nuclear waste, chemical waste, nuclear waste of the Israelis, and so on. So how long can we continue with the situation? Now, yesterday in Tufts, somebody asked me, then why do you need, the, why do you need this authority? Why don't you simply dissolve the authority? The Palestinian authority is not a gift from the Israelis. It's an accumulation of our sacrifices. We had worked hard for it to, to achieve it. It has an embryonic state. I, when I compare Palestine with all respect to South Sudan, I went to see what South Sudan is about. I didn't see a university, no schools, no paved road, and so on. W with all my sympathy there, I went to see East Timur. All this a newly independent state compared to Palestine is uncomparable. The municipality of Naples, my city, was established in 1878. The municipality of Jerusalem, of Hebron, of all these places, we have an incredible culture of institution building, a human capital. The Palestinians have the highest university graduates in the, in the region. So we are there. We are not going to dissolve the authority. Okay? But also, we are not going to continue with the status quo. So where do we go between this and that? We are going to continue to be a national liberation movement that is taking the struggle to the international level. And I think <coughs> that sort of internationalization that needs the will of the international community to impose a solution based on international legitimacy and international law. With all the pressure mechanisms that might work to oblige Israel to do so. Now, also, Bob, we really want a two-state solution. We are internationalizing the struggle because we want to preserve the two-state solution. I know you are a true believer in this. And, but I think we have to do something to preserve it. Why? Because Prime Minister of Israel does not believe in the process and we should not allow him to destroy a two-state solution because it is not only dangerous for Israel, it is, do it is dangerous for us and for Israel as well. Why? Look at the following conclusion that I want to make. Israel is destroying the possibility of a two states in Jerusalem. 125,000 Palestinians were driven out of Jerusalem. The Jordan Valley, as I told you, either you give it to us or we take it. Israel is controlling Area C, that is 62% of the total area of the West Bank. Gaza, they want to keep it as isolated as it should be, according to the Israelis. Now, look at this. Today, there are 651,000 Jewish settlers in the Palestinian territory. But also today, my dear friend, there are 6.1 million Jews living between the Mediterranean Sea and the River Jordan. 6.1 million Jews. In the same geography, there are also today 6.1 million Palestinians. One to one. Because we don't have continuous electricity supply, we don't watch television too much. So birth rate among Palestinians is 3.8%. <laughs> birth rate among Israelis in Israel is 1.2%. 1 
birth rate among the Israeli settlers is 3.2 percent. They watch television, but different programs. <laughs> <coughs> now, if you make this math, you will end by having a situation in which in the year 2020, five years from today, between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea, 53% of the people who will be living there are Palestinians. An erosion of a two-state solution, it means we are slipping into a one-state situation. A one-state situation Israel has to choose today. Netanyahu has to choose today. Either he fulfill a serious commitment to two states and end occupation, or Israel will become an apartheid state. A minority of Jewish people governing a majority of the Palestinian people. This is the reality that we are going to face today. And I hope that we don't go into this direction at all, because the statistics, the figures are there. 2.4 million Palestinians in the West Bank, including Jerusalem, 1.9 million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, and 1.7 million Palestinians, what you call the Israeli Arabs, inside Israel. If you make the math, then it is 6.1, something like that. So therefore, I think it is today a golden opportunity for us to maintain the two states and to fight for it at any level. Because, in my opinion, it is a win-win situation. Now, if you ask me, it's okay with me. A one state is okay, a two states is okay. Because at the end of the day, I want a solution. But if we miss the opportunity for two states, then we are changing the dynamic of the struggle, and we are changing the dynamic of the solution. I said yesterday in the talk at Tufts that in kindergartens there is a game they allow the kids to play, they call it the music chairs. They bring ten kids with nine chairs and they ask them to go around it. And then the teacher, she whistles, or he, and everybody has to find a seat. And then they take one seat, so nine kids ate, uh, ate uh, chairs and so on. Until there is one chair, two kids are fighting who sits on it. Between the River Jordan, between the Mediterranean Sea and Iraq, there are three people for two chairs. Palestinians, Jordanians, and Israelis. A lot of people in the Likud, they think that Palestine is Jordan. In 1948, Israel wanted to dismantle, cancel us, so that there will be two people for two chairs. In 1950, West Bank was annexed to Jordan. In 1967, Israel wanted to cancel us again, but they couldn't. In 1970, in a war that came to be in the literature known as Black September, we, we tried to cancel Jordan. It didn't work. In 1982, the Israelis again tried to cancel us. It didn't work. Then the international community came with an international consensus that the solution is not to cancel one of the three. The solution is to bring a third chair. What we are fighting today, Bob, is the third chair. What I want is a chair equal to this, equal to this, equal to this. What Netanyahu wants me to sit on a chair of a kindergarten. That's called autonomy and not a sovereign state. I am sure that all of you would like to see peace and justice in our part of the world. I, as a Palestinian, would like to live in a good neighborhood called Israel, in which the Israeli security are preserved in which we both contribute to the development of the region, in which the Palestinians, for the first time, they can reach the Mediterranean Sea without a permit or the Dead Sea without a permit. For me, as a Palestinian, <coughs> I want to see a two-state. But if Netanyahu 
does not differentiate between Tel Aviv, a city in Israel, and Ma'ali Adumim, a Jewish settlement in the West Bank, I wonder if the Palestinian will continue to differentiate between Ramallah and Nazareth. I would like to continue to differentiate. I would like to live in a twisted solution. I would like to thank you for being patient with me this afternoon. Thank you very much. <coughs> stimulating, and most of all, uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I know there are going to probably be a lot of uh, questions, and uh, we have uh, half an hour left. Uh, and I'm going to take the liberty as the uh, moderator to ask the first two questions. I'm going to ask them one at a time. And there are questions. Uh, the first question uh, relates to uh, my perspective on the conflict and the fact that I see as one of the principal barriers is, is something won't. you alluded to. One of the principal barriers, something you alluded to, is the internal conflict among Palestinians and the internal conflict among Israelis. And uh, these internal conflicts pose a very substantial leadership challenges. You alluded to this when you and Zippy Lidney, you wanted to have a conversation with her where you're saying, uh, what can I do to help you behind the table? And she suggested to you, well, you, there's a particular sheik and there's probably more than one sheik. Uh, that he was not sheik, he was a sheikh. Sheikh. Uh, <laughs> but that there are uh, virulent anti-Israeli, anti-Semitic uh, things found in books and uh, some teachings in the, in, in the Palestinian territory. And she was probably saying, well, one thing you can do to help me behind the table is if the Palestinian Authority takes some actions to dampen the down. And you said to her, well, one thing you can do is, for God's sakes, halt the settlements. Yes. Because in terms of people on the ground, when they see more and more settlements going up, they lose all confidence. All right? Well, now, the question, my question is the following. The most conspicuous conflict among Palestinians is between Fatah and Hamas. And I know there is a, quote, unity government. Uh, but uh, it is my impression that, in fact, the Palestinian Authority uh, has no authority in Gaza and that Hamas is in control. And I think what creates skepticism on the part of a lot of average Israelis is I think many of them would probably agree with, with certainly my perception, and that is Abu Mazen is a man who would like a two-state solution. But they have no confidence that even if the deal were made, that Abu Mazen would have the capacity to implement the deal <coughs> in Gaza uh, and with Hamas, because many in Hamas are committed to a one-state solution. So I, I guess my question is, how should we think about progress with respect to that internal conflict? Yeah. Obviously, the internal conflict among Israelis goes to this issue of settlements. I mean, Netanyahu uh, uh, was not crazy when he suggested that he would lose control of the Likud party if he stopped settlements entirely. The response, of course, could be, well, you could have still had a coalition. There would have been other parties that might have joined your government. Your government would necessarily fall, fell. But on the other hand, the truth is, it's a challenge uh, with many of his supporters for him to uh, stop settlements. That doesn't make it any less necessary. Nope. Well, look, uh, Bob. <coughs> Maybe the good news is that you brought this question because about six hours ago, the prime minister of the agreed Abun government has arrived in Gaza to really end the conflict. So there is, they launched today a process of reconciliation, the implementation of the agreed Abun reconciliation. And I am hopeful that this internal conflict, which you are 100% right, that is there, that this conflict is going to end soon. 
and this conflict will end on a comprehensive agreement based on three, few things, including a political program. Because at the end of the day, we are not going to go into any partnership with anybody who does not believe in our program. And our program is two states. And our program is to make peace. And our uh, program is not about the destruction of the state of Israel. So therefore, today, six hours ago, our prime minister, who actually called me for uh, other things, but, and he told me he's going to Gaza today, and that the Palestinian agreed upon government will resume responsibility over the entrances of Gaza, Rafah, as well as Eretz, and so on and so forth. And I am very hopeful that this will be really uh, not an excuse in the future for Netanyahu and the Israelis to say that is Abu Mazen in control of Gaza. But also, my dear friend, let me tell you, you see, the issue of Gaza is only six, seven years ago. This peace process has been ongoing for 24 years. There was no problem called Gaza before, but the problem of the occupation continued. The problem of lack of progress in the peace process continued. So the issue is really not Hamas and Gaza and so on. But even though you are 100% right to bring the question, what I'm telling you is that, look, we are in the West Bank. We are in full control of the, of the West Bank. And Israel is, I should say, quote unquote, enjoying a lot of security privileges uh, through the certain coordination and so on and so forth. So what makes things applicable to the West Bank, it makes it applicable to Gaza the moment we are controlled. I, I will tell you. One. And second important issue, the exact question that you asked, actually it was asked by President Obama to our president. He said, what if there will be a deal? Will there be, are you in control of Gaza? So I'm telling you that we are, and here is the situation. It's a tricky situation. Look, on one hand, you are saying, if you are not in control of Gaza, then it will be difficult to have a deal. When we go to be united with Gaza, you say, oh, what are you doing? You are united with, not you, not you, not you, not you, <laughs> not you. I know not you. But you see, in order for, you cannot have the cake and eat it at the same time. We have to have, in order for us to end a three entities situation, to reach a two-state solution, we have to end this split. And I, what I am hoping that United States uh, do, does, not re, does not really veto. Luckily, luckily, the international community minus Israel, they all accepted, they all dealt with the agreed upon government because nobody from Hamas is in that government. But Hamas has given a full approval of the government. And we, when we formed the government, the government, we did form it in full agreement with Hamas. But the United States accepted to deal with it. Europe, everybody did. And now today, as I told you, we started a new discussion over the ending of the conflict so that at least our in-house should be in order in order for us to be able to face the challenges that are, we're going to face with the Israelis and internationally. Well, I, I think that's very promising. But where the tire hits the road, of course, is whether with respect to internal security in Gaza, the Palestinian Authority is able to do something akin to what has been done in the West Bank. After all, there was shelling from Gaza. Uh, and, and it's not even clear to me, by the way, that Hamas controls all the splinter groups in Gaza. So having that, in, given Israeli security concerns, I'm, you understand. I fully understand, and I told you we are ready to accommodate it. The problem, really, you know, Bob, listen, the most important side of the story, don't lose focus on the origin of the problem. The origin of the problem is occupation. The origin of the problem is Israeli occupation. Let's not lose focus about the Israeli occupation. These issues that you're referring to, you are 100% right. They need to be tackled. They need, we need to comfort, and I was telling you that we were ready to accept NATO forces. Even in the West Bank, we are ready to accept NATO forces, international forces, American forces, whoever. By the way, when we said this to the Israeli delegation, they said, oh, we don't trust NATO. But we, but we said, what about American forces? They said, we don't trust American forces. We only trust our own forces. You cannot do that. You cannot do that. You have to have a way in which you have to trust somebody if you need to have a comprehensive peace in the region. That's, so the point really of focus is the forest. 
The forest is occupation, not a single tree here and there and so on. I, I think the, the, last, the, the second and last question I really want to ask is a general question. I, I've come to believe that the biggest barrier is not the internal conflicts, but what I'll call is a relational barrier relating to the two peoples. And I think that it's not clear to me that either side is prepared to articulate a future for the other side that the other side would find bearable. This conflict, the resolution of it, I, I tend to agree with you that uh, uh, although there's going to be a lot of arguments about the details, the broad parameters are pretty well known. Yeah. If there's going to be a two-state deal, there may not be. But, uh, uh, but, but the dilemma of whether the two sides can come to trust each other to honor commitments to take the intermediate steps necessary to implement, particularly given their spoilers on both sides, is a very serious problem. And more importantly, how the parties could work together to rectify each side's perception of the most serious injustices that a settlement requires is a big problem. The Palestinians feel, uh, understandably in terms of their narrative, tremendous sense of injustices. And as you've articulated, the two-state solution, many would accept it, but they view it as unjust because the percentages of the total of what was historically yes. uh, Palestine under the British mandate so small. Uh, uh, for Israelis, there's a group of Israelis, pretty small group of Israelis, who uh, uh, feel that uh, literally uh, that, that they're operating under a biblical injunction uh, to reoccupy the Holy Land as part of their religious duty. I couldn't more profoundly disagree with them. Mm. But in fact, uh, uh, relocating, making 80,000, 100,000, 120,000 settlers move, <coughs> give up their homes, will be perceived by many as very unjust. Others would perceive that you're getting what you deserve. Uh, but how the two sides can help each other manage these difficulties, that's what I worry a lot about because there isn't much empathy one side for the other and there's been sort of uh, 50 years of uh, activities, including violence, uh, which has made people very, very skeptical. Well, look. Uh, so how can the, what can be done on the ground? I guess here's the concrete question. During the next three years, what can each side do consistent with a two-state solution what could they do unilaterally to give more confidence to the other side that it's worth walking down this road? Because n n this current Netanyahu government, for what whatever it is or isn't willing to do, uh, it's not going to be around forever. There'll Look. be a new government. Okay. There'll be a new opportunity. Look, first of all, I think, you know, the settlers, they have left Gaza. And it was okay, it was tolerable, they left Gaza. The settlers, they have been living there for some of them two days, some of them 30 years, some of them 20, 10, and so on. It varies. For the Palestinians who have been uprooted from their homes, is it acceptable that they can be detached from their own homes and for a settler is not possible to be detached no, I, from? I, but I, no, no, no. But I'm just, not saying it's no, not possible. I didn't say that. You said it. Yeah. I'm just trying to reply to you. Right. <clears throat> but also what I think what you are inviting me to answer is a different question. I know what you want, Bob. <laughs> you want to ask me whether it is possible for us to accept any Israeli to stay on the Palestinian territory. That's, I, what I you are, that's what your next question is going to be. But let me tell you. Let me tell you. For us, the issue is not about religious claims. This Palestinian-Israeli conflict, if you drive it into a religious dimension, it, you will go to nowhere. This Palestinian-Israeli conflict has to be settled on political ground and not on religious ground. The other important point, I think, if there is a will, there is always a way. 
Molcho, the 50% of the Israeli delegation, he asked me, do you accept an Israeli to stay on the, on the Palestinian state? And I told him, listen, if that Israeli is not a soldier, if that Israeli is not a settler, I am ready to accept. There is a gentle lady, the correspondent of Haaretz, her name is Amira Has, quite a number of you don't know her. She lives in Ramallah. She rented a flat. She pays rent. She stops at the traffic lights. She abides by the Palestinian law. I would like to welcome her. I would like her to come and live in Palestine if she wants. So we do, as long as this is not part of the colonial legacy and so on. So for what I'm telling you is that the conflict should be seen as a political issue, not a religious issue. The settlers, by the way, and this is important for you to note that 82% of the settlers who live in the Palestinian territory are driven by economic reasons. Right. I don't have any percentage, but which right. means that they are looking for cheap flats for a different and so on. So, so this is easy to reverse. The ideological settlers who are called the Gosh Amunim of the woven Kippa, I think it's easy to handle because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, there will be a solution. If we believe in two states, we have to make it two states. I want a Palestinian sovereign state, not a state with the continuation of the Israeli army, a continuation of Israeli settlers, a continuation of taking our, and so on and so forth. Otherwise, what is the meaning of the two states? That is the most important side of the story. Steps, though, the question was, during the next two or three years, what steps can each side take unilaterally that could signal to the people on the other side there is hope, uh, uh, we, we, we You know what I want to reply to this question? I want the wall to come down so the Israelis will see me. Today, the Israelis, they don't see us. The Israelis don't see what is behind the wall. The best thing for peace education is to allow the people to talk to each other. In other words, allow Israelis living in Israel proper to come visit and Bank. allow me to go and visit. Right. So it's, it's the wall has made things impossible. The Israelis who live on that side, they don't see us. They don't know what is happening behind the wall. The most important part of the story is that you engage the public, privatize peace, create a peace based on the unjuization of peace, make it a non-governmental issue. There are a lot of things that will contribute to the process which I call peace education. That's what I think that we should do. Great, thank you. Let's take some questions. I'm, I've, I've had more than my share. Yes. Um, I want to thank, first of all, Dr. Shtaye for, it was a great honor hearing you. Um, my name is Gal, I'm an Israeli student at the college, and I actually had the great honor of speaking to Ali Jarbawi and Nabil Shaat last year in Ramallah. And the one question that I felt that they also... I would like you to come and live in Palestine. <laughs> <laughs> I am happy in Israel, but I would love to have a better relationship with Palestine. But my question is regarding something that is not always addressed, and that is actually the 48 conflict. So it's very easy to resolve the 67 conflict, as you said, the basics and the premises for it are known to all sides in a certain relation. What will have to be withdrawn and the, the, the smaller tactics of it. But regarding refugees and Palestinian refugees, there hasn't been a very clear addressment of this issue. And in none of the in peace negotiations has there ever been a resolution to it. And at the end of the day, when it will be resolved, this is an issue that we'll maintain. And without coming to a certain conclusion on it, I see that in, in addition to all the internal issues that were addressed by Professor Mnuchin, as a great hindering to peace. I would like to hear your opinion about it. Yes. So, so I'm going to just repeat what I understand the question is, and you correct me. Uh, uh, with respect to the Palestinian refugees and the claim of the right of return, uh, I, I'm, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I know many Israelis are deeply concerned that if there were an individual or collective right of return to Israel proper, uh, there wouldn't be one Palestinian state, there'd be two Palestinian states. And she sees little discussion 
uh, among Palestinians about what most people who have studied the conflict realize, and that is uh, there will be a right of return to the new Palestinian state, there would be compensation, there would be the right to return to other states, and Israel as a sovereign might agree to accept some returns, but there's not going to be an option for all several million refugees to go back to Israel as their choice. That's the Israeli perception. That that's a, there's no deal if that happens. And so the question they have is, why among Palestinians isn't there much discussion of this? It seems to be a taboo subject. No, it's not taboo. <clears throat> but uh, you answered 50% of the, of the question. And let me tackle the other 50%. That, the 50% that you, you contributed to the answer is that there are options. Right. There are actually, we proposed options. Options to solve the refugees. First of all, we said that we are not going to impose 8 million Palestinians on, in Israel. We're not going to allow an influx of Palestinians into Israel. That's not going to happen. We have said that the Palestinian refugee question need to be tackled on agreed upon basis. Nobody imposes. So Israel does not say no right of return. And we don't say no, everything should happen and so on. So we came up with a formula that we think should be acceptable. And by the way, I should tell you that it was acceptable to certain Israeli leaders. And I will refer a few examples to you. What are the options that we, we talked about? One option that refugees will be asked whether they would like to stay wherever they are now if the host country allows with compensation. Second option is refugees can go to a third country if that country allows with compensation. A third option is that these refugees can come to the independent future Palestinian state. And a fourth option is that if they want to go back to their homes in Haifa, Jaffa and so on, with this option we said we will agree with the Israelis on how many and over how many years. So what else, what else can we do? This is the best formula. But now let me refer you to two things. In Camp David, Ehud Barak for 19 days refused to sit down one-to-one -one with Yasser Arafat. Ask Rob Mali. He was there and now he is in the National Security Council here in Washington. And he wrote an article about it. Read his article. So, Clinton was walking in the middle, Ehud Barak was here, and Yasser Arafat was there. Clinton asked Yasser Arafat, what is a priority for you when it comes to the refugees? It was, remember, 2000, the year 2000, there was not the issue of the Palestinian refugees in Syria and so on. So Arafat told him, the refugees in Lebanon. Because the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon are not allowed to work in 84 different professions. He cannot be an engineer, he cannot be a doctor, he cannot be, he can, the Palestinian refugee in Lebanon cannot even buy a flat. Because the Lebanese are sensitive to the demographic balance of Sunni, Shia, Maronite, non-Maronite, all these cocktails that mix Lebanon. So he said, Clinton asked him, how many are they? He asked Yasser Arafat. So Arafat told him 400,000. Then Clinton looked at Ehud Barak and he told him, 400,000 over 12 years, is it okay with you? Which means to allow the return of 400,000 Palestinians into Israel over 12 years. But Ehud Barak stayed silent. He didn't say no, and he didn't say yes. More than that, after the collapse of Camp David, Shula, we went to Taba. The head of the Israeli delegation was... Galad Sher. No, was Shlomo bin Ami. He was the Minister of Foreign Affairs. With Shlomo bin Ami, we reached an agreement that Israel will recognize in principle the, the, the political responsibility 
of the refugees, not the humanitarian responsibility. Because the Israelis, they used to say that we will tackle the issue on a humanitarian basis. So the Palestinian refugees will go back to their homes as part of a family unification, not as part of a right of return, and so on and so forth. So there are options. Now let me tell you one important thing. I went to a refugee camp. It was, for me, a big step, a big serious step. They asked me about what is happening with the right of return. We all want to go back and so on and so forth. So I said, fine, fine. We are actually working on it with the, on the negotiating table. It's one of the most important issues on the table. But I would like to ask you, the one who asked me, I said, I would like to, where are you going to go? He said, I want to go to Haifa. Okay, I said, fine, we'll bring you back to Haifa. But remember one important thing. Haifa is not anymore part of Palestine. If you go back to Haifa, you are migrating to Israel. You will learn Hebrew. You will stand for the national anthem of Israel. You have to take the Israeli buses. You have to be Arnona. You have, he said, what? I said, exactly that is it. So there is a debate. Uh, there is an education of the, we are challenging things. But the most important part of the story, my dear gentle lady, I wish you all the success. This is not a matter of only educating the Palestinians. The issue is also educating the Israeli public, the settlers, who every day go and knock at the doors of the Palestinians and tell them, this is not your home. And this is not, and this is not, and this is not. So this whole issue brings me back to what Bob was asking me about peace education. In order for us to really move somewhere, it is the public that has elected Netanyahu a few days ago. It is this public that is going very right. It is this public that is misled with unrealistic fear that is planted in the people's mind that if you don't elect me, that is the end of the world and so on and so forth. And thank you for the question. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Or he's seating to you. <laughs> immediately wanted to change the topic and uh, I'd like to bring the topic back to Hamas for a moment. Um, the last time that Israel ceded land to the Palestinians in Gaza, uh, there was an election. Uh, Hamas won the elections. They started firing thousands of rockets at Israeli towns and cities and then also threw members of your party off of rooftops. Now, uh, I'm assuming that the state you want to create will be a democracy. I feel like most Israelis uh, want peace, but they are not suicidal. And I want to know why you're so confident that what happened in Gaza will not happen again if Israel leaves the West Bank. Because simply it's not happening in the West Bank. We are already there. Oh. Don't think, my dear, listen, wait a minute. Wait, don't trash things. Wait a minute. Don't think that the, <laughs> the security of the state of Israel today is because of the, of the presence of the, of the Israeli army. No, you are wrong. Go and ask the, the head of the Shin Beit. Go and, tell, go and listen to the Israeli security people, what do they tell Netanyahu? They tell Netanyahu, I want to tell you one thing, Israel has built a wall. Do you know how many Palestinians jump over the wall illegally to work in Israel? This is the Israeli statistic. 42,000 people cross the wall every day illegally to work in Israel. So what is the security value of the wall? It is, what is happening? The settlers are just a few meters away from the Palestinians. If the settlers who cross ro wrongly drive their cars into Jericho or Ramallah, our security people, they take them from their hands and they hand them over to the Israelis. We don't take them hostages. We don't beat them up and so on and so forth. So no, sir. The security situation in the West Bank is due to the effective, efficient performance of the Palestinian security forces. This is the most important part of the story. Well, uh, listen, this, uh, 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 I, I think we, I promised it's 5.30 that we would finish. Uh, I want to thank all of you. Uh, you've been a great audience, and you've done a very interesting and terrific job. Thank you. For all of you, what I want to remind you of is that next Monday at 4 o'clock, I, I sort of jumped the gun, uh, Galad Sher, who was 
uh, Prime Minister Barack's chief negotiator at Camp David, and has been very active in something called the Blue and White Initiative, uh, uh, and very much has been working towards a two-state solution, is going to be here, uh, and we're going to have another uh, process. I know he's an admirer of yours. He's I'm, a nice man. And I'm you sorry should you, welcome him. I, he's I, a nice man. I, I'm, to sorry, him. <laughs> I'm sorry that the two of you couldn't have been here together, and I just wish the two of you had the power to make a deal. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. The problem was you said so few things I disagreed with. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you're, you. You're a wonderful well, advocate. Yeah.